Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back. I hope you all enjoyed your lunch. This is the sort of the death lecture, if you like, where you all had your lunch and I want to sit down and go to sleep. So pe feel free if you do, and I'll wake you when I've finished so you can listen to Fabio, who's doing an interesting lecture. I've been here four years now. The first year, um, I think I spoke about the Middle East, then I spoke about South Africa, then a job in Europe, and I'm going to speak about India today, a job I did... Um, a few years ago, as you'll notice if you're keen-eyed on the video, I've got darker hair there. It's before I started dyeing it. So it is a few, a few years ago. If anybody's got any interesting projects coming up in the next year, Fabio, in South America, I'd be interested to come, so I've got something to talk about next year. So what we're going on with this time, then, is the demolition of... The demolition of the Ramagundam B thermal power station in India. As I say, it's a job I did a, a few years ago, and it was an interesting project, so I thought I'd just tell you a few little stories about it. it uh, Ramagundam is in the state of Andhra Pradesh, which you can see there. The capital is Hyderabad, and it's on the eastern side, or central eastern side, of India. There you can see Ramagundam, it's about 200 kilometres north of Hyderabad, and it's quite a, a rural setting. Um, it's not India as you see it when you look at Mumbai and New Delhi, places like that. It's pretty much out in the sticks. It's an industrial area, though, because there's a lot of coal mines through the area and a lot of power stations, with a population of about a quarter of a million at the time I went. There's probably more there now. Surrounded by coal mines, and during the summer when we started the project, it was average temperatures of 40 degrees. A few little facts about India. It's the seventh largest country in the world, but however, it's the second most populated country with a population of 1.2 billion people, which is 16% of the world's population. It's the largest democracy in the world with 2,000 ethnic groups and 17 different languages. It's got a lot of different sub-languages from that, but if you have a look at a, an Indian banknote, you see written on it, it's got the actual the currency in all the different languages. It's got the third largest military force in the world, but never invaded another country in 10,000 years. It's a really interesting and diverse um, country, and the bit I'm going to talk about, as I say, is the rural part, not, not the cities. Doing business in India, and this probably applies to doing business with Indians anywhere in the world. I find the same things were, were happening in Dubai, where you're working with Indian managers and Indian workforces. They never directly refuse as if they may offend. So if you ask them, or the, the client says, I want that done in two weeks, there'll be a, a lot of shaking and yes, we can do it in two weeks, even though you know for a fact it will take six. So they do try and please, and it's not always to their advantage. So sometimes you have to be reined back in, but obviously you can't do it within a meeting because you don't want them to lose face. So they like to please, basically. They like punctuality but it's not always uh, reciprocated. I had a lot of meetings to go to when I was in India, and when they're with the government or with the police, you've got to be there at a certain time. IST means Indian Standard Time. It should read Indian Stretchable Time, because although they expect you to be there on time, they may well keep you waiting for a number of hours until they feel ready to see you. They're not being rude, it's just the way that things are. They believe in karma, what they do in this life affects the next, so they're never rushed and they think things through. And they have a hierarchy system where they respect the seniors and the decisions for the bigger companies always come from the top. So if you want a decision making, you have to wait while it goes up the chain, comes back down the chain. They have a caste system, which is basically a pecking order, if you like, which starts with the priests, goes through the warriors, goes through the engineers, goes through the, the lesser mortals, and just down off the page, I think you'll find demolition engineers. Okay. And been, been a bit diplomatic. Corruption is not unknown. Money's often changed to get things done. For the whole time I was there, I had a guy with me who went everywhere to every meeting with me, whether it was with the police, whether it was the government, and he would come with me and he knew exactly how to deal with each department. For example, to get a license from the police, we went to see the police guy, who was a great guy, and he said, no problem, I just want three video recorders, three televisions, and three microwaves for my three substations. Not for himself, for his three substations, and then you can have your license. Next day, they turned up, we got the license. Don't offer bribes, because you don't, we don't know the system. Leave it to the internal Indian people who know how it works. 
Just to say it's not pie in the sky, that's a, an article from the Times of India from this year, which basically says over half, over 50% of people offered bribes to get things done in India, which is twice the, the, the world average. So, getting back to the project, when I got the, the, uh, the, the call, I was with Control Demolition Group in the UK before I started my own company, and I got the, the word to fly out to Hyderabad to have an initial meeting with the client. I didn't know who the client was, but just go out and have a word. So I flew out to Hyderabad. When I got there, I found that the client was National Thermal Power Corporation, who at the time were in the FT100, uh, top 100, so quite a big company. They were in other power stations in the area. Unbeknown to me, the main contractor who was sitting there was Toshiba Asia, which made me look a bit of a dummy when I went with all my Sony laptop and my Sony video players and all my little bits to set up. It didn't go down well with the, the MD there. And the demolition contractors were a company called Delta Mekon India Limited. Don't worry if you haven't heard of them, because they probably did this job and never got into demolition again, because you find out there, if there's an angle, a company will take it. Probably the week before, they were selling mobile phones. Probably when the job finished, they'd gone to do something else. They filled the void, and they actually got the, the project. The scope of works, and this was in the April we went out here, the scope of works for the job was the explosive demolition of two cooling towers, one boiler house, and up to 10 various freestanding structures. And they were all concrete. It's not like a power station in this country. It's not as big. Um, but there's very similar buildings. Limitations and considerations. It had to be started as soon as possible. Six weeks program to the blowdown. This was the cooling towers and the boiler house. The blowdown prior to the monsoon season, which was only two months away in June. The maximum available machine that we could get on site would be 20 tonnes. The demolition contractor and explosives contractor was responsible for obtaining all the licenses and permissions from the government and the police. And local labour had to be used where possible. If you have seen local labour in the rural areas, it's not the best in the world. You don't get many skilled operators, and this would be a typical demolition project um, in India. Although they do have innovative ways for doing concrete breaking, And it's long-winded, but they get the muck shift done and the rubble removed on time. <laughs> Following the meeting in Hyderabad, we all jumped in the car. We went the 200 kilometres up to, to the site uh, at Ramagundam. It had been disused for a long time, and it was overgrown now um, with bracken, with trees, with bushes. A lot of the area was overgrown. You can see the two cooling towers there. Standard cooling towers, nothing special, only about 60 metres, so they weren't the biggest in the world and a number, of other, a number of other buildings around. You can see the boiler house here and various other concrete structures. Nothing that would cause any problems um, over here or even um, over in, in India, as it happened. We also found out a bit about the wildlife in Andhra Pradesh. When I looked on the internet before I left, I just ch checked it out to see what's over there. And that's the risk that came up. Tigers, panthers, wolves, sloth bears. I've got to say they weren't all on site, not at the same time. But our biggest problem was the snakes. Because it had been left there for so long, it was inundated with nests of snakes, uh, mainly cobras and some, uh, um, some pythons. Just for interest, 10 to, 10, 10 to 12,000 deaths per year from snake bites in India, compared to 10 to 12 a year in America or 10 to 12 in Europe. So it was quite, quite common over there. And the first thing that... Um, Toshiba did, in fact, wouldn't let us start the job, or anybody start the job, until we had a doctor permanently on site and venom available. Because there were Europeans and there were Japanese going to be in the area, they wanted a doctor and venom. Cobras everywhere, they used to wrap themselves around the, the hoses on the compressors to keep warm at night. And pythons. There was a big python on the site, a large python that used to go around the drains. Um, and when I sent my first report back to control demolition, saying I'd arrived on site, there was this going on, there was that going on, I said, there's a large python on the site. I got a response back from uh, a couple of days later saying, can you not blow it up? And I thought, <laughs> I thought it's a bit extreme blowing up wildlife. So I said, you can't go blowing wildlife up, uh, you can't go blowing wildlife up over here, you know, it'll upset people. And they, they apologised and said, python, we thought you meant a pylon. So... <laughs> Um, the snake was okay. 
There was also bees, a lot of uh, nests of bees there, which made it hard for the drawing, and scorpions in the undergrowth. Added to that, the area was um, had an, a lot of Naxalite terrorists. These are sort of left-wing extremists who are against the government. And many evenings when you're working there, you could hear the gunfire in, in the background um, with the Naxalite terrorists, They're mainly against the police and the government. It wasn't a threat to me, um, so I believe. Although one day when I was on site, we did have a, a car came with a motorbike behind it and a guy with a machine gun. And I thought, oh, so I sidestepped quietly into one of the buildings and hid. Um, well, there was a lot of shouting going on, he then left, and when I went down to the site office, they, they told me he was a local labour guy who'd come to collect his money. He ran the local labour and made sure he got paid. So, on return to UK, we assessed the project, we assessed the risks, we decided it was expendable, we produced the method statement, drawings, manpower, and all the other bits that go with it, we sent the client the price and the relevant information, and he accepted and work began. That's a standard cooling tower. We can do them with ropes now, thanks very much. And it's great. I was there when Abel did those with ropes, and it is a, a good method, another option to do, but there are still cases where we'd use explosives. We use explosives on this standard principle, two-thirds of the shell, two-thirds of the, uh, the, the legs, blast it, and it will fall over. So the project wasn't difficult um, in respect of any of the structures. The boiler house had about 60 legs, all concrete legs, so a case, it was just a case of drilling the legs and blasting the legs, the idea being that we toppled it forward away from a turbine hole at the back. Pre-arrival task then, so I was back in the UK now, outload the equipment, order the explosives through the uh, Indian Explosives Company, and deploy to site myself as the explosive engineer project manager in country, they had to collate the stores, the manpower and the equipment, get all that together, begin the process of obtaining the license, start speaking to the police, to the government for the explosives license, and break out around the columns. The packs were still inside, the, the packs of the legs, the, the things inside the, the cooling towers were still there, so they had to be removed so we could actually erect the scaffold to drill the towers. We produced a programme based on a six-week programme, we sent that to them, Work started. I returned back to India three weeks later. They put up a site office, which consisted of this tent, and they've got basic facilities. This was the toilet. Now, it looks like a toilet, it is a toilet, but unless you've been to India, you don't realize the importance of a toilet uh, if you're not a, a fan of Indian food. The meals that we got over there, basically breakfast was rice with some spices in it, Lunch was rice with more spices in it, and dinner was really spicy rice. As you can imagine, breakfast plus lunch plus dinner. Okay. And we call it a deli belly, so anybody who's suffered from a deli belly knows the consequences. <laughs> Trust me, it was quite severe. And I've got to say, I'll put my hands up for the full six weeks that I was over there, I suffered from we don't, too much information, okay. Okay, however, work was going on. They started breaking out the walls and they started the erection of scaffold. If you can see the scaffold there, basically it consisted of wooden poles lashed together with string. It looks a bit Heath Robinson, a bit Mickey Mouse, but it actually is very effective and it works. There you can see the scaffold around one of the legs of the, um, the boiler house. Not too bad because it's basically only about, I don't know, three or four metres high and we could drill, the guys could drill off that reasonably safely. They'd got the equipment, however the equipment was quite antiquated, quite dated, there were very old compressors, although saying that the guy that stood next to it is the engineer whose whole job was to keep that machine going and every time it broke down, and it did considerably, a considerable amount of times, he would get it fixed quite quickly. So although the kit was uh, old, they did have people to deal with it. However, they were still removing the insides of the cooling towers. The police wouldn't issue an explosives license because I wasn't there and they wanted to speak to us. Um, so things were dropping a bit behind. So they'd only just started putting the scaffold in on the towers and they reckoned it'd be two weeks a tower before we could start drilling. So we weren't going to make blow down before the monsoon. The monsoon comes in June and everybody knows the exact date when the monsoon's going to come. So to make sure we hit the deadline, we had to order extra manpower, both from the UK and local, and extra equipment to man up. 
We got two drillers over, two UK drillers who came over to help drilling, and we got one more explosive engineer so he could be on site while I had to go to Hyderabad or Chennai to do these meetings and sit around and, and get all the licenses done. The explosive engineer, God bless him, he lasted one day on site before he became ill, and he went back the next day and flew back to the UK. So I was there on my own, but I had two drillers who were good guys who kept the job going while I was away. Here you can see the drilling of the towel legs. It was a great achievement to get them to get boots and helmets, because when we first got there, it was flip-flops and no helmets. So just to achieve boots, when it, boots didn't fit, but they had boots and they had helmets. There was 38 legs to drill, nearly 500 holes per tower. 800 holes to drill in the boiler house. And when they completed the scaffold, you can see it there. The other thing with the snakes, this scaffold here is probably about 15 metres high. Where it was lashed together, the, the, the baby snakes used to wrap themselves around the lashings at night. So when you go in the morning, if you started climbing up the ladders and things, you had to be careful that the little snakes weren't, little buggers, weren't in amongst it. They completed the scaffolding, um, and we could manage to start drilling. About 1,000 holes per tower, so they weren't that big as cooling towers go. So we had about over 3,000 holes to drill, and with their drillers and our guys that were over there, um, they got on with the drilling. We always do a test blast. When I went to the initial meeting in Hyderabad, um, the guy said to me, they'd have somebody else over there from another country. Um, I won't say which country it was, because they might be listening on my phone. Um, <laughs> they had another company over there, and they had all these calculations on how it was going to come down and what was going to happen. And, and they asked me for my calculations on to how I knew that the explosives were sufficient to take the concrete out. And I said, well, we'll show you. We'll do a test when we get onto site. They said, oh, no, no, we want calculations. I said, but what can be better than actually having you there, stand there, put the explosives in, fire it, and you see that it does it? And they agreed. And I think that was one of the things that, that got us the job. So we, we, we said we'd do some test blasts, and that's what we did. This is one of the legs um, on the cooling tower. And there you can see the results. Uh, it took it away. There, there's not much rebar in there. It was pretty good. We did another test blast up on the shell using local explosives just so we knew how powerful it was. And again, it blew a hole in the shell. We did one on the uh, boiler house. And again, you can see the back legs of the boiler house, no reinforcing. So we thought, no, it's not bad. There's not much reinforcing in any of these legs. So we did one more test blast. And you can see that, there, and that's just a, a one story little building there. So it must have had some heavy equipment on top for that, that amount of reinforcing in it. So it's worth doing test blasts just so you know what's, what you're playing against. So, everything going to plan. We're all doing well. We'd got all the scaffold up. We drilled it and all that. And then, and then the rain came. Okay, it was about three or four days uh, before the blowdown. We are just about to start charging up. And then it lashed it down. The video doesn't actually show it as, good, as bad as it was, I suppose. But when it rains on the monsoon season, it really does, it really does rain. There's a picture, but I'll show you a little video. And again, it doesn't show it too bad, but it's uh, what Ramagundam was like. Can we put on the first video, please? And it's the monsoon season in Ramagundam in central India. In three days' time, the town's power station will be the site of India's biggest ever explosive demolition. Two cooling towers, 200 feet high, and a boiler house are due to be demolished. And it's causing some interest. Only an Englishman would wear white trousers in a monsoon. You thought El Paso was a technical job. <laughs> okay. The reason the rain was a problem was because they had no non-electrical initiation. We had to use electrical detonators and things like that. We also had to use detonating cord. And for those that don't know, detonating cord's got a white powder inside. And if it gets wet, it won't go off. So we had to seal every piece of detonating cord. And there was probably about three or 4,000 pieces of detonating cord we were going to use. We had to seal all the ends to make sure the water wouldn't get in. 
when we put it in the hose and we had to make sure that the electrical initiation system didn't get wet. So it caused problems and we, had, we only had the three days to blow down. <coughs> Here you can see it, it's standard stuff, just explosive charges that go in the hose and then they're connected together. It was, as I say, it was never a technically difficult job, it was just the, the circumstances. What we do also do is plug the hose with, with um, clay and you buy that in boxes in the UK. We had these two guys who spent about two months just rolling mud into little bits of, uh, into little rolls so they could go in the holes. And they, they'd get that mud from outside, make these little rolls up, and we'd put that in the holes to stop the, the charges getting wet. Here you can see the cooling towers, the holes in the cooling towers. That's the test blast, and again, the holes around the cooling towers. In the UK, anybody that's done a, uh, an evacuation, and we've got, say, I know William's here from Safe Dem, and, and they know that the amount of time and money and labour that goes into an evacuation, getting it right, is probably as important as the job. I talked about it over in, in Ramagundam, and they said, don't worry about it, don't worry about it, we'll tell them on the day. And I said, but you can't, you need, people need to know, I said, don't worry about it, we'll tell them on the day. So the day came, I was waiting for things to happen, and we went into the evacuation. Can I have the next video, please? Basically, they came in on the morning and they just moved everybody out. They've all got sticks. It worked, it worked, but by the time when 8 o'clock came, which was the time we were going to do the, the demolition, they cleared everybody out, we had the police commissioner there, and he said, yep, yeah, they're all free, everybody's out, and all the sentries were in position. Everything in position then, all it was left was to, to push the button. And again, we'll do a quick video of the board, and I apologise for the quality of it, um, it's taken from a TV snip, so it's not the best in the world. The thing that falls off the top of the tower is a beehive when it looks like when it comes falling off the top. You see it in close up. That there. That. No. So that was the, the cooling towers, it came down sweet, that was the boiler house came down sweet, didn't cause any damage behind to the, um, the turbine hole. Here you can see the cooling tower again, basically fell within its own circumference, a little bit to the front, but that was acceptable, it was a, an open site. There you can see the, the boiler house has come down and the, the hoppers, again, they fell forward as predicted, nothing technical about it, I won't pretend there was. And as you can see, the back of the bar has dropped down so that they could get the machines on it, break it up. It was only like concrete, uh, and they wanted to keep the building behind. A couple of the structures around and about the site. So, was the project successful? Nobody was bitten by snakes. Nobody was shot or captured by terrorists. All the structures came down safely. The client was happy. My deli belly cleared up within two weeks of getting home and I was on proper food again. The large python was taken to Hyderabad Zoo, where so it remains to this day and gives lectures to the other animals about this. <laughs> and the company made a few million rupees out of it. So, yeah, it was a successful project and it was very interesting and I would do it again uh, without any, any shadow of a doubt. It's a brilliant country, India. Um, and the people were, were lovely to work for. Although I'd take my own food, my own pot noodles. <laughs> so final thoughts, we sit here in these lovely surroundings of the hotel. Just remember, in other countries like India, people are starving. And for the cost of a dozen donuts, you could feed a starving child. <laughs> Thanks for listening, and I took more than three minutes. Thank you.